It's an honor to be with you this morning as we continue in our series. We are journeying, journey, I can't say that word, we're taking a journey, how about that, with Jesus through the Gospel of Luke, and we are going pretty much in chronological order here, kind of looking at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry and what that still means for our lives today. And I want to begin today by uh, uh, telling you a story about a conversation I had with a friend of mine a little while back. I, I talked to him and he was telling me how he got a phone call from his sister. And on the other end of the line, his sister was rather panicked and and almost crying. And she was explaining to him that their father was having some very blurred vision. And she was really concerned about that and wanted to bring him in to the ER. She was worried that maybe he was having a stroke or some other concerns. But there was a problem with this plan. Uh, Well, the father just simply didn't want to go. Hey, imagine that. Their father was a little stubborn, and instead of going to the emergency room, he first wanted to see his cousin, who happens to be an eye doctor. So he wanted to check with his cousin, his eye doctor cousin, before going to the ER. So they say, fine, fine, that's better than nothing. So they they load him in the car, and they get to the eye clinic, and the great irony of it is she had to drive 20 minutes past the emergency room to get to the eye clinic. You know how that goes. And when they get there, the offices are closed. They thought he was there, but he wasn't. So his sisters and his mother, they start yelling and, and crying, and you can imagine the chaos and the panic. So finally, they convince their dad that they need to take him to the ER. But just as they're pulling into the hospital parking lot, his cousin returns his phone call and says, I'll drive into the office and see you right away. So they turn around in the parking lot of the hospital there and they drive back to the eye doctors where they meet his his cousin and there's more panicking, there's more yelling, there's more confusion. And finally, the doctor can see him and he begins to examine their dad's eyes, his cousin's eyes, and he asks my friend's dad, An important question. He says, have you been using any kind of eye drops? Well, the father reaches into his pocket and he pulls out the bottle of eye drops that he's been using, which was some kind of of saline or moisturizing drops, or at least that's what he thought they were. Turns out that his dad had been putting drops in his eye that he thought was treating his dry eyes, but they were actually drops that were meant to numb the eye before surgery. And... The reason they were in his possession is they had been prescribed to Gidget, his parents' family pug, for a procedure they had a little while ago. So those two hours of panic and fear, frustration and tears had been caused because his dad was using eye drops that were intended for the dog that he thought were just normal saline drops. Now, the good news, it didn't cause any damage to his eyes and they figured it out, but here's the point. I think my friend's father should have made sure that he knew the purpose of those eye drops before using them. That would have certainly avoided a lot of wasted time and confusion and frustration. But we can go much more general than that for our lives. And generally speaking, when we don't know or fully understand the purpose of something, we're going to find ourselves experiencing a lot of confusion, a lot of frustration, and maybe even some wasted time, because it's safe to say that purpose does indeed matter. And what I want us to see today is that we're going to be looking at a passage where Jesus is laying out for his listeners then, but for all of us today, what the purpose of his mission was, but also what the purpose is that Christ gives each and every one of us, the purpose and mission that he gives the church to carry on his work as well. And to help with that and to dig deeper into that, we're going to be in Luke chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter, in a little bit we'll begin at the 14th verse. The, the verses will be on the screen behind me as well. But just to recap a little bit of, of where we've been, we've been looking at how Jesus has been prepared for this mission that he's about to embark on here, this mission that he's about to proclaim to the world. Pastor Vicki did a great job last week reminding us that the genealogy of Jesus points to God's hand all the way back from the beginning, that this is God's ordained appointment here in Jesus. We've seen how Jesus has been baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, that he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. We saw a couple weeks ago how he even resisted Satan in the temptations in the wilderness, and now in this passage, Jesus goes back 
into a synagogue in Nazareth, and he delivers a sermon, again, that's going to outline this ministry that he is about to embark on. Now, typically, we don't go to Luke 4 to understand Jesus' ministry, but I think Luke includes this passage and this moment at the beginning to let us know that this is a defining moment for Jesus, that this is a defining moment for his ministry because it defines his purpose. And like I said, it's going to tell us what ours is as his church. Luke definitely sees this moment as a very, very important time in Jesus's earthly ministry. So let's look at this and see what we can learn about the mission and purpose of Jesus here. We're going to pick up in verse 14, and we're going to be starting and stopping a little bit instead of reading the whole passage, but just follow along here. At verse 14, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. You know, I love that Luke starts with this because it reminds us from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, Luke lets us know that this is a ministry that's empowered by one thing and one thing only, and that is the Holy Spirit. It's empowered by the Holy Spirit. We saw that it was a spirit that came down on Jesus. It was a spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness and out of the wilderness. And now it's the spirit that's empowering and equipping him here. This is telling us that everything that Jesus does in his public ministry, it grows out of him being fully God, right? He is the Holy Spirit here. He is God. He is Jesus. And this is growing out of everything that he's doing. But here's the thing. That's true for us as well, right? We follow the spirit. We follow the Spirit's leading and the prompting. We pray for the Spirit to go before us as we fulfill the Great Commission, as we are followers of Jesus, as we complete his mission. We want to be Spirit-filled as well. Not our own plans, not our own time, not our own agendas, but rather what God is doing in our midst and in our hearts. So I love that Luke points out that it's in the power of the Spirit that Jesus is speaking. And now he's going to focus in. He's going to focus in on a particular time where Jesus taught in the synagogues. Jesus would have done this uh, several, several, several times, but in this particular time, he tells us this. He says, he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. You know, as they gathered for for worship, they would have done things probably very similar to like we still do today in a different way. They would have probably sang some psalms, they would have recited the Shema together, and it was tradition for someone to read from the scrolls and then to give a sermon as well. So that is what Jesus is, is doing today, is he is reading a passage from the Torah, a passage from the scrolls, and he is going to give a little sermon about what it is he's reading. Now, what I think is significant is what Jesus chooses to read. He's handed the scroll. He knows it quite well. He could have picked any part of Isaiah. And if you've spent any time in Isaiah, you know there is so much that one could pull out of that book. There are so many lessons and truths and promises and hope to cling to throughout the prophet Isaiah. But Jesus picks these verses very intentionally. He picks them on purpose for a purpose, for his purpose of his ministry here. And here's what Luke writes. He tells us this, unrolling it, Jesus found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. You know, there's a phrase in in, in culture today called mic mic drop. Have you ever heard that? Like somebody says something really profound and they just drop the mic and walk off the stage. I think sometimes it's easy to think that's what Jesus does here is he just reads his passage and sits down and walks off the stage. No, what it says he sits down, what would have happened is there is usually a bench or a stool in the middle of the temples or the synagogues there and, and the teacher would sit on that in order to teach and instruct the listeners there. So that's what it means when Jesus sits down. But this is what it says in response to what Jesus is doing here. It says, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. 
Now, the passage from Isaiah that Jesus read is about this idea of the year of the Lord's favor, which is called the year of Jubilee. And that occurs when God finally rescues his, his people, rescues his creation. So it's important to maybe remind ourselves or learn for the first time what that year of, of Jubilee was. And in their tradition and their practices, the year of Jubilee came every 15th year. Okay, for, or excuse me, 50th year, I'm sorry. And it was a time in which debts were canceled, okay? So all the debts were canceled if you owed anybody anything every 50 years. It was a time in which land, if it had been divvied up or, or separated, was given back to the original owners. And those among the Jews who had, had sold themselves into slavery to earn a living, to provide for family, were, would be set free, would be given their freedom back every 50 years in this year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee. So you can imagine Imagine in these years that it was a time of great joy, of great celebration as freedom truly reigned and they were embracing the freedoms that they had together. Now you might ask yourself, why would, why would God do this? Why would this be a ritual, a tradition, a custom that they would have? And really I think we can boil it down to is that, it, that people, as we do today, needed a reminder that everything was God's. Right? Everything belonged to God. Nothing we have is truly our own. It belongs to God. That God, first and foremost, is in charge. That God's reign has one big practical implication. That that is God's, not mine. And when God's reign was realized, then his people were released from that bondage. And Jesus here is proclaiming that with his presence, with his life, with his ministry, the start of his ministry, the plan of God has been put into motion. That the plan of God is now moving forward to release not just the hearers there, but the entire world from this bondage. And all of this plan is gloriously centered on Jesus, from proclaiming the good news here in the synagogue to his earthly ministries, to all the miracles and teachings that he's going to do, and ultimately to his death in his resurrection when death and sin were defeated. But it continues on, as we know, in the power of his resurrection, the ministry, the purpose of the church, his body, our as brothers and sisters in Christ, this is all part of God enacting this eternal jubilee, this release from bondage. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a kind of a, a churchy phrase. What does it mean to be released from bondage? And I think, I think this is important for us today, especially in the context of our lives. If you look in Luke and the book of Acts, it, it's come to to mean a broad meaning. Of course it means release from our sins. Of course it means the bondage of sin over our life, but it's also a release from suffering, from disease, from oppressive powers, the promises that we find in eternity and of heaven. It includes the release of physical oppression and spiritual oppression. You know, we could say that basically it means that God's ultimate will, God's ultimate plan is a release from anything that God never intended to dominate our lives. I don't know about you, but I don't think it takes much looking out in the world to see that there are plenty of things that can dominate our lives or other people's lives that God did not intend. Right? You can turn on the news and hear of conflicts and, and suffering. You can hear what's going on in, in Israel right now and have your hearts just broken for these people. You can see and hear about stories and statistics that truly break your heart, but certainly break God's heart. For example, God did not intend for us to live in hatred of one another. God did not intend for us to live in fear of one another, to be fighting one another, to be killing and murdering each other. God certainly did not intend for 3.1 million children every year to die from undernourishment. God certainly didn't intend for 4.5 million women and girls to be victims of sex slavery each year. You know, I don't believe that God ever intended for anyone to be addicted to things like pornography or substances. And God certainly did not intend for our friends or our child or a family member to walk away from their faith in Jesus. This is how one author put it, and I love this. I want to share this this morning. This author says this, For Jesus, for Jesus, the kingdom will be marked by the end of oppressive injustices against the poor, the mourning, and the righteous, and the establishment of a Torah-observant people from the inside out. People who do God's will as taught by Jesus, which means that they are holy, reverent, loving, and wise. There's so much in there. 
But this is Jesus' mission. This is Jesus' mission for us and for his church to be people who are transformed by his word, by his presence and promises for our lives from the inside out. That our hearts are softened and moldable to what God is doing in our lives so that we can be people who do our best to do as Jesus taught. That we can do our best to be those hands and feet of Jesus. That we can be people who are holy and reverent and loving and wise so that God's kingdom can expand. God's kingdom of ending oppressive justices against the poor, the mourning, and the righteousness. That is what he has in store, but it starts with the softness of our hearts. It starts with the willingness for us to say, here I am, Lord, use me. And we hear this as Jesus' mission and what he is saying in the synagogue. It, It puts our mission into perspective because it tells us that our primary goal as Discover Church, but as any church in this country, in this world, our primary goal of the church is not to make us more comfortable with our lives or even more comfortable in this church. And what we do in our church and our efforts and our mission and our outreach and our love and compassion should always be calibrated towards bringing God's rule more holy into the world around us. We pray, we sang this morning, his kingdom come, his will be done as at earth is in heaven and on earth. And I think the song even added, and in my heart, right? in my heart as well. See, that is what we're saying as we work to move God's kingdom where we see more and more glimpses of the way God intended it to be. I've heard it said this way, that to follow Jesus is, is for us to be moving not towards our own comfort, but towards the needs around us, the needs of others. And needs, sometimes that sounds like such a negative thing, right? It's not good to be needy. No, these are, these are heartfelt realities that God has compassion for and he wants us to move towards the needs of others. So for us, that absolutely means sharing the gospel, the love of Christ. It means reflecting the love that we know from Jesus into the world. It means supporting missions and missionaries across the globe, absolutely. It means that we pray for those individuals in in distress in times of troubles, and it means that we reach out in the loving arms of Christ into our community. But we do that no matter the cost or how uncomfortable it can make us, and it means that we follow the Spirit's lead to take on the oppression that God does not intend in the world no matter the cost. And I don't know about you, and that sounds good, and and we may not object to that, but it is easier said than done. It's not always an easy thing for us to take steps towards or for us to know how to apply that into our lives or even sometimes we might just want to flat out disagree with what Jesus is saying here and I want to be clear with you if that is in your heart at all, you're not alone. The audience here in this synagogue was not real happy about where Jesus was going to take this because he's taking what he just said and read from Isaiah and now he's turning it into reality for them. He's giving them a glimpse of what this looks like and after Jesus finishes his sermon, the people are going to react. And we see at the beginning that, yes, they are amazed by what he's saying, but that amazement is going to fade very quickly. Let's go at verse 22. It says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. They'd seen him raised up from a little boy. They're watching him now proclaiming uh, the, the scriptures with such authority, with saying things that are catching their ears. So there are some in the crowd that are trying to figure this out. Maybe they're doubting, maybe they're questioning, maybe they're figuring out what's going on. But Jesus, of course, he knows their hearts, right? He knows their hearts, and he says this to them. He knows the uncomfortable truth that they need to hear about what his kingdom, about what his mission, and about what his purpose is. This is what he says in verse 23 on. He says, Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do hear in your hometown what you have heard that we have heard you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah did not, was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zephyrath, where the, season, excuse me, the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, and yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian, and then look at the response here. We'll talk about that in a second, but look at the response. It says, all the people in the synagogue were furious 
when they heard this. They got up, they drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked through, right through the crowd and went on his way. You know, you can read that ending there and go, what in the world happened? What in the world happened? Jesus stands up and announces that God's reign is here, that his plan is in motion. It's in motion through him and the people are amazed, but then he follows it up with what that really means and what that's going to look like and somehow this leads them to wanting to kill him, to drive him not only out of the synagogue but out of this world. And there's some reasons that the, the Nazarenes were upset here. Okay, And part of the reasons we may not see is perhaps we're not familiar with the Old Testament references that Jesus made there, but he referred to two Two Old Testament stories where God does a mighty act of rescue. Rescue, salvation, whatever you want to call it, God does a mighty act of rescue. The first was releasing a widow from impending death caused by a famine, and the second was a military commander who was rescued or, or freed from the oppressions physically and socially of leprosy. But here was the thing with both of those people that Jesus referenced. They were Gentiles. They were Gentiles. They were not people among God's chosen people. They were not Jewish. And that was not comfortable or easy for his audience to hear. But remember how earlier we said that Jesus is quoting Isaiah and he's defining his message as taking the good news to the poor. And that is taking it to those not just poor financially, but those who, for whatever reason, are considered outside the honorable bonds of society. That's the message that Jesus is delivering to start his ministry. And Jesus stands up and he says this to this crowd of of good, well-intended church-attending people. And he says, God's mission isn't going to just be limited to those people who you might consider to be worthy and honorable. It is going to be committed to and open to everyone that all in all creation can be a part of the kingdom of God through me. That all can receive the grace of God through me. And I don't know about you, I'll speak from my own humility, we need that reminder sometimes. We need that reminder or sometimes even that warning for us to do a little reality check. I think what Luke wants us to see and embrace here is that it's not necessarily the idea of living on mission for God that concerns us. We like that. We want to do that. We want to help. We want to support. We want to do what we can as long as I'm okay with it, right? It's when the mission that God calls us to leads us somewhere that we don't want to go or we don't think we should or we don't think they're worthy, that's where things get stickier and that's where things get a little bit more difficult because truth be told, no one likes to be outside of comfort zones or at least not too often. They call them that for a reason. They're comfortable. We like it there. We know what to expect. It's, you know, we're used to it. It's familiar. And our comfort zones exist in so many ways. We have comfort zones socially. We have comfort zones financially. We have comfort zones ethnically. We have comfort zones that are based on our traditions or what we know. We have comfort zones that are are based on what we think God is demanding of us here. And God wants to take us out of those comfort zones. He wants to take our limited view and expand it little by little by little as we break out of these comfort zones. And I can promise you this, if you want to boldly and courageously step out in mission for God, if you want to follow Christ and ask for the Spirit to lead you, for the Spirit to prompt you, guess what? I can be confident that as you do, God is going to stretch you in ways that you've never expected. You're going to be stretched in ways that you never expected. You will see your heart softened towards people, towards groups, towards places, towards opportunities that perhaps you were once hardened to, that you'll be finding yourself doing things that you said, I'll never, ever, ever do that. I'll never do that. Well, guess what? God is going to take our obedience and he's going to stretch us and he's going to grow our softened hearts and mold them into the purposes and the plans that he has for us. But here's the thing. God puts a mission before us as the church. He puts a mission before us as Discover Church, but he puts the same mission before each and every one of you as a child of God. And that mission is to go as God goes. That mission is to go where God is going, where the Holy Spirit is leading. And that's to all corners of the earth. And it is to all peoples, regardless of our opinions, regardless of our differences, regardless of our preferences, God calls us to go. 
to see as he sees, to love as he loves, and to reach out in compassion the way that he did for this world in humility and in service to those around us. And in fact, I want to give us a, 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 something that perhaps we can all do this week to, to try to grab a hold of this mission that Jesus gives us, of this purpose. And I don't know about you, but, but days get busy. Weeks go by faster than I wish, right? It's, it's, it's not, not uncommon to forget some things here or not prioritize the things that you want to do. What did the Apostle Paul say? Why is it I keep doing the things I don't want to do and can't do the things I want to do, right? We struggle with this. But I know this, each and every day, we have opportunities before us where we can either be sensitive to what God is giving us in that moment or we can just keep going about with our tasks and our routines. And as you're going through your week this week, I want you to be praying and looking for opportunities where you can engage in what I like to call intentional acts of caring. Okay? Intentional acts of caring. This is not just serving somebody. It's not just doing something nice for somebody. Caring, I think, goes a little bit deeper than that. You know, we talk about sharing the gospel with the world, and so often when we talk about that, we focus on the words that we say, and that's important. That's important, but I once heard it said that, that, that nobody really cares what you know until they know that you care, Right? We can talk about Jesus all we want, but we got to remember that God wants us to care for people. Not just tell them about God's love, but care for them as his hands and his feet as Jesus would. Jesus modeled so much for us in his earthly life, and he modeled definitely how important it is to care for people's needs. We saw him heal the sick and perform miracles and feed the hungry, but we also see that he cared for the whole person. He listened. He engaged in dialogue. He expressed compassion, and he didn't just meet their spiritual needs. He met them in their needs wherever they were, and I think we have opportunities to do that. We may not be able to perform the miracles that Jesus did, but you know what? Sometimes we just got to slow down enough to listen. Sometimes we just got to slow down enough to hear how it is we might be able to care or help or speak to somebody, how to be an encouragement to them. Sometimes we just have to show them that, that we care by checking in with them, by seeing how things are going. In other words, as we look at sharing the gospel by caring, we need to remember that, that, that they're not projects, they're people, right? They're God's creation, they're God's children, they're people. So friends, my hope and my prayer for us, as Jesus puts this mission before us for, for the oppressed, the missions for the poor, for those who, who think they are outside the scope of God's love for them, that we can be people who, who are on mission to care, who are on mission for Jesus. And we recognize that caring, guess what? It's not always comfortable. Stepping out on mission for Jesus is not always comfortable, but it's in those uncomfortable moments where I firmly believe we find our purpose and where we see God is stretching us even sometimes beyond our limits. And it may be hard, and we might be hesitant to step out of those comfort zones. But again, I firmly believe that it's in those moments where we are uncomfortable that those are the places that we begin to find, to discover, and to embrace the transformative power of God in our lives. So friends, I hope that we can be confident in all that we do as Discover Church, that we can be confident in what we do in our daily lives, that we are on mission for Jesus, that the Holy Spirit will equip us for the journey, and just as Jesus loved and cared for people's needs, we can do the same in our lives. It's my hope today that we all go from here with hearts that are open, with spirits that are willing to follow wherever it is that God is leading, because we know that as we do, that is how we become the hands and feet of Jesus. That is how we reflect who Jesus is into the world and how we can help others embrace the grace that's so freely extended to each and every one of them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as, as we gather here today, Father, we just thank you for the reminder of what your mission, your purpose is all about. Lord, we thank you for the reminder of how vast your love for this world is. And Lord, we recognize that following you and, and portraying that love to the world around us may be uncomfortable. And it may take us out of our comfort zones. But Lord, we recognize that it's your power, your spirit that's transforming our lives. So Lord, I pray for that transformative reality for each and every one of us, Lord, from the inside out. 
Lord, that you can chip away those, those roadblocks, you can chip away those things that perhaps are, are causing us to, to view the world in a way that, that you don't, Lord, or that are keeping us from the opportunities to, to serve and love those around us. And Lord, I just pray that you continue to equip us, Lord, equip us to be on mission for you, that you fill us with your confidence. Lord, we know that you are present and, and with us. And Father, I pray that you open our eyes this week to love and care for people as you do. Lord, help us to see all that we come in contact with, first and foremost, as your creation, as a child of yours, and help us to just point through our words, through our actions, through our prayers, point them to you in their lives. And Lord, as we think of the words that Jesus read from the prophet Isaiah in that synagogue, Lord, to set the oppressed free. Lord, we know that there's so much oppression in this world. Lord, we know that there are moments and times and places where the darkness seems to be winning, where it's raining. Lord, I can't help but think today of Israel. Father, we, we lift before you the, the tensions that are there as we watch the events unfold in the news. We can be at a loss for words. And Lord, we know that there's too much violence, there's too much hurting and fear there and in other places of this world. So Father, we pray for the people of Israel and Palestine. Lord, we ask that you protect them in the midst of this escalation of violence right now. Lord, we pray that you can shelter people, your people from harm, Lord, help get families to safety and to shield them with your peace and your protection. Lord, we ask that you can thwart the efforts of the enemy. Lord, can you confuse their minds, their efforts, that, Father, you can stop those who want to sow hatred, violence into our world. Father, as we said, these are things that you do not intend for your kingdom. These are things that you do not intend for us. So, Father, we just ask that you can bind up that hatred that division, the fear in Israel, in Palestinian society, Lord, in all places of the earth where there is tension, Lord, where there are battles, where there is fear. But Father, we call upon your name because yours is the only name we can call upon for hope and for peace. So Father, may you continue to lower tensions and hatred in this world between different peoples, between different groups. And Lord, as your peace goes before and amongst us, we pray that it always points and brings glory to your name. But Lord, we just pray for your supernatural protection over all involved in the situation in the Middle East. And Lord, as we leave here today and we talk about the mounting realities in the world, it's easy to feel small. It's easy to feel like, what can I do? But Lord, I just pray that we remember each and every day all you ask is for us to have an open heart and a willing spirit that's ready to follow your lead wherever it takes us. So, Father, I pray that in our diversity of talents, abilities, and passions, Lord, that you help us all to become true ambassadors for your love and pointing others to your grace and your purpose for their life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you sing with us? Where you go, we will follow Through the dark, through the narrow Where you go, and where you go, we will follow. To the dark, to the narrow, and in all we do, oh, we are bound to you. I want to be close to you. I want to be close. Nothing in this world that compares to all you are. I want to be close to you. I want to be close to you. There's nothing in this world that compares to all.